Hello and welcome to OLA 2020. Thank you for joining us for this session, Getting an Edge, Innovative Ideas for Supporting Oklahoma Edge. I'm Jennifer Terry, this year's Chair of the Children and Teen Services Roundtable, and I am so happy to be moderating this session. I am joined by our session presenters, Macy Fallon and Sadie Ford. Macy Fallon is a Children's Associate Librarian at the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library in the Pioneer Library System and has previously worked at the Oklahoma Science Museum. Macy has a passion for developing young minds through STEM programming. She is currently a student in the Masters of Library Science program at the University of North Texas. Sadie Ford is an Information Services Librarian at the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library, also in the Pioneer Library System, and has previously worked in public libraries. She received her MLIS from the University of Missouri in 2018. She currently serves as the volunteer coordinator at her branch and enjoys developing programs for teens. I'll be back at the end of the session for some questions, but now I want to turn it over to our presenters. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Maisie Fallon, and I work as a children's library associate at the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library. Hi, everyone. I'm Sadie Ford. I'm an information services librarian at Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library. And our topic for today is Getting an Edge, Innovative Ideas for Supporting Oklahoma Edge. We will be highlighting four ways that our library has supported Oklahoma Edge. So just to give you a little context about who we are to start off with, um, Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library is one of 12 branches in the Pioneer Library System, which covers um, Cleveland, McLean, and Pottawatomie County. We also serve students in the Moore Public School District, which is the third largest public school district in the state. So that's just some context to start off with. So what is Oklahoma Edge? I don't know if you guys know a lot about it. Uh, Oklahoma Edge is the Oklahoma State Department of Education's commitment to giving students a competitive edge as they pursue college and career. So what that means now is that high schoolers are now required to complete an ICAP. Uh, an ICAP is an individual career action plan. So high schoolers now have to start thinking critically about the career they want to have in the future and to make a plan to achieve their career goals. Um, so this is all about career readiness. Uh, while middle school and elementary school students aren't required to complete an ICAP, um, they are starting to have to think critically about the career they want to have in the future and to start exploring different career options. So students are now engaging in more activities and tying those activities to careers uh, so that they are prepared to make that decision. Um, so we t in our presentation, we're going to talk about what, Oklahoma, what we're doing for Oklahoma Edge at Southwest OKC Library. Um, if you guys have ways you're supporting Oklahoma Edge at your library, we would love to hear from you and uh, we'll leave our contact information on one of the last slides so you can let us know. So what are we doing to support Oklahoma Edge? So in our presentation, we'll discuss four ways that we have supported Oklahoma Edge at our library so far. Um, just to give you an overview, this includes Design Squad, which is a program series, Steam Stations, which is passive programming, Discovery Camps is also a program series, and then we'll overview our Summer Volunteer Program as well. In each of these um, four ways, we will cover an overview, planning, lessons learned, and the impact of these programs. So the first one we're going to cover is Design Squad. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's pretty famous. Uh, it's an engineering series created by PBS. They even had a TV show about it. And there are multiple, multiple ways to implement uh, Design Squad. Uh, it can either be as a series, um, a pre-planned one for six or 12 weeks, or you can pick individual lesson plans and follow those. But basically every, uh, every program that you do with Design Squad follows the design process, which is just the series of steps that engineers take to uh, 
to create a functional end product. Um, so the design process goes ask, explore, model, evaluate, and explain. So at uh, so I'm going to give the example of our first design squad, which was they had to build a structure using newspapers that could support the weight of 10 books. So that was the ask portion. We gave them that challenge and then we grouped them up and then they had to explore and come up with a design that would uh, for the structure using only newspapers that would support the 10 books. So they would have to build the, the, the structure, and then they'd have to evaluate it, see how it worked, find flaws, and then go back and fix any flaws that they have. And then, um, and then either they completed the challenge or a time ran out. Um, but regardless, they have to explain um, their design and what was good about their design and what they've learned, and they, sh they share it with the group. So every, every program follows that outline even though there's a different question being posed or challenge being posed. So how we implemented Design Squad at South OKC, um, we did it as six week, uh, six week series. So the kids would meet once a week uh, on Fridays for an hour and a half, and they would get a new challenge every week. So um, the first time we did it, we did the packaged uh, lesson plans the package six week lesson plans. And that's really awesome because you get to partner clubs that way. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out so well for us. Our partner clubs just didn't get back to us as much as we liked. Uh, but it is a really great opportunity to introduce uh, children to uh, other children um, in different states or different parts of the world even. So other libraries have found success doing this. Uh, so it's worth a try. Uh, and the kids didn't mind when our partner clubs kind of fell through. So it's not something that you should be afraid to try. Um, the second time we did it, we picked individual lessons and still followed the design process. Uh, but we picked our own lessons, so that was the only difference. Uh, the great thing about Design Squad is that you can adjust the lesson plans a lot. So as you can see, all the supplies are in the back in this photo. Um, so for Design Squad, you do separate all the supplies because the children have to draw out their designs before they can get supplies to build. And uh, Design Squad really gives you a lot of flexibility with the supplies. So some supplies that they recommend are more expensive. Uh, so they have alternative, cheaper alternatives that you can use. And that's always really great. And the amount of time you give the children to design uh, and to build, you can really adjust all of that to fit to your library needs. Like it doesn't have to be an hour and a half. Okay. So lessons learned from Design Squad. Um, the first lesson we learned was that kids work at different speeds. So even our first week, there were some kids that were working until the very end to create their, uh, their newspaper structure. Um, and then some kids that finished 10, 15 minutes earlier. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the last lesson I outlined uh, follow the set follow a set outline if you follow a set outline and set those expectations from week one it really really helps to uh, to manage the group uh, and it teaches them that hey once you come in you grab your name tag you sit on the carpet the leader of the program will uh, do the introductions then you'll draw your designs out and then you bring your design up to the um, up to either the lead or the co-lead of the program, and they will give you the supplies once they once you've explained your design. And once you've done the building, the testing, and you're, uh, you're happy with your product, then you go to the, then you notify one of uh, the leads and you go to the carpet and there'll be a separate activity for you to participate in um, so that you're not bored and they're not, you know, just running around for 15 minutes while everyone else finishes. And then, um, as you can see from the photo, everyone works in groups. That's one of the big things about Design Squad. It's all about teamwork. And we learned that it's best to partner the kids up yourself. Um, it wasn't a huge issue, but we really wanted all of the kids to participate in all aspects of the design process. So um, putting a really, really shy kid with 
a group of really loud and like strong-willed kids means that shy kid doesn't really get as much of an opportunity to talk and to contribute. And so if you just try and like make sure it's an evenly balanced group, it really helps so that all of the kids get the most out of the experience. And then my favorite lesson learned was that you should always share your struggles. When we did Design Squad, uh, we test, we built the designs before the program uh, to see how it would work. And there were some weeks where the designs were really hard and we really struggled. And when we shared the, that with the kids, it really motivated them to do well and to complete the challenge and to show us how smart they were. Um, but it also gave them an opportunity to teach us, like, I'm not an engineer. I don't have an engineering degree. Um, I've got a history degree and now I'm getting my master's in library science. So I'm not the expert in this field and sharing that with the kids really gives them the, it really shows them the importance of the design process and why you have to, ex to explain at the very end because it's a learning opportunity for everyone, um, including the librarian who leads the program. So the impacts of the design uh, squad. So it really promotes a growth mindset, which is the try, try again mentality, not necessarily the succeed at all costs. Um, the whole point of design squad is just to learn and to try, um, not necessarily to have a functioning end product because you can learn from uh, designs that don't necessarily work. And then, of course, teamwork. Uh, as I said, teamwork is a huge part of the design process uh, or the design squad. Um, and as you can see, even the testing stage, they did it as a team. Uh, this is a public library, so these kids aren't coming in knowing everyone in the, in the program. And so it's really awesome to see them grow and change and depend on one, in, one another and find uh, the strengths within their team and to grow from that. And so that was really a powerful impact that we saw. And then this is an introduction to engineering. Um, uh, engineering, there are a wide range of uh, careers within that field. And if you go to the Design Squad uh, website and look at their individual lesson plans, it'll even tell you what type of engineering they're doing, whether it's electrical or whatever it is. Um, and so it's really great to show them the variety within that field. And of course, this doesn't mean that these kids, just because they like Design Squad, are gonna be engineers, you know? It just gives them an introduction to engineering and to the careers that are available in that field. And that's really what ties it back to Oklahoma Edge, just introducing the, the career options to them. And then, of course, it introduces engineering terminology. That's kind of the best aspect of Design Squad and following their lesson plans. They will give you the terminology that you need to know uh, in order to communicate or in order to allow the kids to communicate effectively um, why their designs are working or what the problem is. Because uh, without the vocabulary, they they're kind of just guessing a little bit um, about what's wrong. And so, yeah, I love doing Design Squad. It was a lot of fun, especially to see those kids grow together. Uh, but next we're gonna be talking about discovery camps. I pass off to Sadie. So building on kind of getting in that steam and career exposure, um, we, built a program series called Discovery Camps, which were two-day camps um, for children five to seven years old and eight to 11 years old. And we also had a teen option available, which was one day. Um, the main structure for the two-day camps was that the first day library staff members would provide a activity. And then we would also sort of introduce those terms and the topic of that week. And then on the second day, we brought in an outside presenter from the community who could speak more on the subject um, and was an expert in that field. So like I said, these were um, mostly focused on emphasizing STEAM career options for children. So 
So um, this page is kind of just to show you some examples of the weeks, the different topics we had each week. Um, the way that we formulated like choosing topics for these programs was that we went to the Oklahoma Works 100 critical occupations list and that's in our resources page. So we chose careers off of that list that sounded interesting to us and would appeal to our community. Um, and then we, you can see we had nine weeks of discovery camps and each week we, did, we covered a different topic. So to get a little bit more into the planning side for these programs, um, we had an interactive activity um, so that the kids could kind of get into exploring those career choices and areas of study. Um, so we wanted to provide that hands-on learning experience. Uh, in the photo, you'll see that we were building a boat as part of the engineering week to see if it would float. And then additionally, um, we practice using the scientific inquiry throughout the program, which is very similar or somewhat similar to the design process that Maisie mentioned earlier. So it's ask, predict, investigate, observe, and explain. And we were just really intentional with reviewing each step of the scientific inquiry as we demonstrated activities and introduced the topic for that week. And then, of course, we wanted to emphasize that career exploration from a young age. So we brought in um, a professional in the STEAM area of study so participants could connect with that professional and use that connection as a resource, too. Um, so we did provide, you know, the conventional resources during the program of like books on display so we can encourage participants to continue exploring after the program. We also um, encourage those presenter connections during the program between the families and the expert, that person in the career field. So to build upon um, the presenter side of planning for discovery camps, our main intention was to build those relationships with our community and really seek out contacts that we might be able to utilize even beyond um, discovery camps. So there's a couple different avenues that we went about finding presenters for these programs, one of which is local businesses. Um, they, you never know until you reach out to see if they'll be interested um, in participating, but they're definitely out there in the careers. So we went to local businesses um, we had success with partnering with an organization called iFly, and they offer indoor flight. We brought them in for our gravity topic, and it was a successful partnership because they donated um, prizes to our summer learning challenge even after the program. So that was one success we had. Additionally, we sought out staff contacts. Um, so we just asked staff members, you know, um, to seek out their own connections in different career fields. Um, they probably know people who are in those career fields. And from that, we actually had a connection with uh, the Advanced Radar Center and they brought out the weather van for the weather week um, topic. So that was also success successful. And then finally, um, educational institutions are a great resource um, for finding these types of presenters. The, the, their presenters are going to be experts in the, the field that you're looking for. And these types of organizations often incentivize employees to volunteer their time or perform outreach um, so it reflects on their own organizations as well. We had success with partnering with an engineering educator from a local technology center, and he actually came back multiple times throughout the year for additional programming. Um, including for a robotics challenge, as well as some other STEAM programming. A few things with communication in terms of finding presenters, which you may be familiar with if you work with presenters often. Um, we wanted to be very specific about what we wanted from the program. 
Um, so we did seek someone who had worked in the field or was an expert on the subject. And to ensure that the structure of the program was consistent across the multiple weeks we had of this programming, we asked that the presenter show um, staff a 10 minute presentation about their career and then bring a 30 minute activity. So staff got to see those presentations and activities beforehand and then um, the presenter brought it to our participants. We also just made sure to see that the presenter had experience with the age group that was involved. That five to seven year old age group um, needed a specific presenter experience. And then we expected that the presenters would volunteer their time. We determined their technology needs and we also encouraged them to arrive early on the day of. So just some general guidelines. Um, we did find we wanted to find a good fit for the program. So we started early uh, to, to get the people and work with their schedules. And we had an ongoing conversation with presenters up until the program. So this again is just a slide um, for you to reference uh, to give an example of the different types of presenters that we use for this programming and kind of an example of organizations that you might seek out um, that are local to your library. So to expand a bit on lessons learned for Discovery Camps, the first year that we implemented this programming, we actually had the two age groups, the five to seven and the eight to 11 year old group um, come together for the same presenter. And we found that this uh, wasn't as successful. We wanted to tailor the presenter experience more to each age group. In terms of presenters, I kind of mentioned some of these, but we just made sure to be specific with them, follow up fairly frequently up until the program. And we also found that having a full-time staff member be the main point of contact for presenters to be the most successful we did have part-time staff members helping with these programs, so we uh, ensured that we had consistent communication when we had a full-time staff member as the contact. In terms of the age range, I did mention we had a teen discovery camp option. Uh, this was not as successful for multiple reasons, um, some of which I'll cover more in our teen volunteer section, but simply their summer availability isn't as there. And then the interest, uh, most importantly, in this programming wasn't as high um, as the ages of the younger ages, um, because there was a lot of overlap with school-related content that they were already getting. Uh, so the topics just were not as intriguing to the teens at this point. We have found that there were different ways to engage teens and their community more successfully, and I'll discuss those later in this presentation. So to speak to the overall impact of Discovery Camps, we built those community relationships, which we've still been able to utilize in other programming. And we were able to really mediate those connections with our participants with those presenters that we brought in. So we encouraged those families to connect with that person in the career field. This kind of gets to the idea that we we were trying to change perspectives about the library, public libraries as a whole. Um, so people often see libraries as books, as a resource, even as community space more and more and more. Um, we really wanted this program to showcase that the library could connect participants to their local community and um, see the, the success of those connections. And so all of this really worked towards that idea in Oklahoma Edge of workforce development. We wanted the participants to have increased exploration of career options from a young age. And so in the long term sense, discovery camps are intended to support workforce development. I just want to conclude about discovery camps with an example of a presenter that we had for the program. Uh, he was a chemistry professor that came out um, from OU and he came to one of our teen discovery camps 
um, for the topic of chemistry. And as he was going through an activity, he actually mentioned that he oversaw an internship program for high schoolers at the university. So this was something that teens could access at their age um, and provide further career exploration. And staff members had no idea that this professor was overseeing this program. Uh, so it was just one of those really great moments of discovery for both staff members and the participants there. And that kind of gets to the whole idea of the connections and workforce development involved with discovery camps. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about steam stations. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, they're still fairly new for our library. We started it in January of 2019. So it is just a passive station with steam activities on it. Um, so steam station will just have the materials uh, for kids to interact with, a challenge for them to complete, and an introduction to a career in some way, and then a book display tying back to either the activity or a career or the career. So as you can see from this photo, it can be really simple if you want it to be, or it can be really complicated. But in this photo, our, uh, our materials were just the paper cups, and the challenge was to build the tallest structure that you can using the paper cups. Um, and then we had a sign, which I'll show you in the next photo, uh, saying, if you like this activity, you might want to be an engineer. And then a book display that went along with it. So it's really simple, but they're so much fun. So planning a steam station. Um, so steam stations can seem really overwhelming, but uh, there are a lot of ways to plan them. Uh, one of my coworkers suggested thinking of it as a mini program. So you just take a, a small aspect of a program that you have planned in the past or are planning and you just set it out. So, uh, yeah. And then of course you can do engineering, which is a really easy subject because all you have to do is set out materials and the kids have fun just building with it, um, just like with the paper cups. And then of course you can go to children's books. Uh, I don't know if you guys have explored the nonfiction like science experiment section uh, in the children's department, but there have been a lot of really great books published lately. I even uh, in our resources slide, it will be our last slide, I've mentioned one of my favorite uh, authors. So you can check those out and you might have to make some modifications because this is passive. These are just things that, that you're leaving out throughout the day for customers to interact with. You'll, you might have to make some changes to make them work in a library space, but for the most part, they're really helpful for getting ideas. And then of course you can go to coworkers. Um, one of my coworkers suggested uh, a 3D coloring page uh, that I will talk about later. And then you can go to community partners. Uh, Sadie talked about community partners a lot, which I appreciated because for me, I was, a, I was nervous uh, to approach uh, presenters or community partners to ask if they, they would help. But the thing is, we're not experts in any of these uh, fields, you know, or we work in libraries uh, and these community partners really do want to help. Uh, so I, I'm currently working with a, with the geology discovery camp uh, presenter to develop a geology steam station. And so she's fairly happy and excited to work with me on this because, you know, this was, she loves her job. She wants to share that with kids and she's pointing me towards, uh, organizations that will donate uh, rocks uh, to the library, rocks and fossils to the library. And so we're reaching out for, uh, to them for that. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out to community partners, even if it seems a little scary. And then of course you can uh, just pick a topic or career that you like and just explore that, you know, anything that sounds interesting, uh, you really, you really can't mess up with a steam station. Um, I think the important part is that you tie it back to a career. Uh, that's how you support Oklahoma Edge. And so how we do that is just with a little sign that says, if you like this activity, you may want to be 
an engineer or an architect, uh, and then a simple definition of what those are. Um, and that's really all you have to do to connect it back to Oklahoma Edge. Uh, and a steam station can fit into multiple uh, career categories, you know, depending on what the kids found interesting about the activity, like the the paper cups struck, uh, build the tallest structure uh, challenge that we gave. I put uh, be an engineer or an architect because some kids just wanted to build a really cool, really tall structure. Um, so yeah. Okay, so lessons learned with steam stations. Uh, as I said, they were fairly new, so it was, uh, it's, it's been a lot of testing with them. And the first lesson I learned is from my very first steam station, which is that top right photo. It was a magnet steam station, and I had a lot of fun planning it. Uh, I put a lot of work into it, um, and there were probably, I think there were probably four or five challenges associated with it, as you can see from the photo. There were a lot of uh, different elements in there. I put so much time into it and it was very, very popular. But um, this was in the children's department. So it got a lot of love um, very quickly. Uh, parts of it were missing. And so you really don't have to make things complicated for yourself. You don't have to put a lot of time into it for kids to love it because um, immediately after that, we put the paper cups out and did that engineering challenge. And it was just as popular as this magnet steam station that I spent hours creating, you know? Um, so you just have to, you don't have to put too much time into it. Um, and then from this magnet, uh, the magnet steam station. We also learned that we need to rotate the steam stations. Um, as I said, this was in the children's department and it was really popular. Um, but children are children, you know, they want to play with the things that you leave out. They give them the supplies a lot of love. So elements of it will get broken, you know. Um, and we learned about uh, keeping them out about two weeks was the best for our department. Um, but we also have a steam station in the teen department uh, and at that steam station you can keep out supplies for a really long time and it doesn't cause any problems whatsoever so it just you have to kind of adjust towards your audience um, and then look to other librarians so the more public library which is in our library system uh, is also doing steam stations i found out uh, a little late on that, but they've been doing steam stations longer than us. Uh, and I reached out to them and it was such a great opportunity because the librarian there, Vana, had been doing it longer than I had. She had a lot more experience with it. And uh, we decided to partner up. So instead of creating two steam stations a month, I started to create one and she created one. And every two weeks we would just swap steam stations. So that's, you know, we didn't have to overwork ourselves with just one steam station, you know. And then you have to kind of judge how much of a mess is okay in your department, you know. If you look at that left photo, that is a lava lamp uh, steam station in the teen department. And as you can see from the table, there are a lot of liquids on that table. Uh, so obviously that was never going to be a possibility in the children's department, uh, just, if you've worked with children, you know that'd be an instant disaster. Um, but it was really popular in teens, um, and uh, we didn't think it'd be too messy, but as you can see from the table, it got very, very messy. And you really can't judge, uh, you really can't judge that until you try it, because we did a pendulum painting uh, steam station that I'll talk about later that was super popular and not uh, too messy. So you kind of have to just trial and error it. And then of course, you can't forget that this is a passive station. Uh, so you have to be okay with leaving out supplies and not and just trusting the customers with those supplies. You know, um, we did a VR steam station, which is that right bottom photo there. And we did put some measures in place with the 
VR goggles and that customers had to come and check out the VR goggles before they used them. But this wasn't uh, very passive because if they had any troubleshooting issues, we couldn't immediately assist them. We can't see what's on their screen. We, unless we take away the VR goggles, there's nothing we can do to help them really. So it wasn't super passive. All right, I know I shared a lot of uh, lessons learned, but I wanted to share some successful steam stations that we had because we had a lot of them and they were great. Um, so the first one is uh, through this app called Quiver Vision and that's this top right photo. Um, it's the 3D coloring pages that I learned about from a coworker who found out about it in a college class. So it was very random, but you download this uh, app, Quiver Vision, to your phone or a smart device, uh, and you print out these coloring pages that are mostly free. There's some that cost money, and some of them are even educational, like the one in this photo. And uh, the kids can color the coloring page, and then they use the app to make it 3D. And they can, uh, in the case of this volcano one, they could watch the volcano erupt. They could learn about volcanoes. So this covered a wide range of STEAM topics, as you can see. So it's geology, it's um, technology, it's art. So that was a really popular one. And we even put it out in the team department and it was popular there too. And then of course the pendulum painting, uh, Sadie actually built the pendulum and I'll show you a photo later. And it was a hugely popular station in the team department. And then this bottom left photo is of a steam station that I put out with the challenge of write, draw, or type a story. And I even set out some uh, story prompts and some kids did do the story prompts. Um, but for the most part, the kids were really interested in just the typewriter. And so we had a lot of parents and uh, children just talking about how technology changed, you know. And of course, they're not saying things like how technology evolved and stuff like that. They're talking about, hey, if I type something, I can't just delete it. And the parents explaining to them like, yeah, this was this was a real thing that we had to that people had to deal with, you know, you have to get white out and to fix this. And so it was an opportunity to, uh, for the kids to learn about how technology had changed. And while that didn't match the challenge, it really fits with the overall goal of the STEAM stations, which is to have conversations about STEAM. Um, yeah. And then um, the last successful uh, STEAM station idea that I wanted to share was the light table. And this was from Vana Moore, she sent this to us. And it was just a simple light table with some supplies. And so the kids uh, could either build on it, which would be engineering, but the goal was to have them talk about whether or not an object was transparent or not, and what transparent or not is. Um, and that was really great because it was, transparent is not a difficult word, but it's, introducing that terminology to the kids at an early age and having them talk about that because that's physics and that's really important uh, knowledge that they can have. Okay, so the impacts of the steam stations. As I said, they're so much fun. I have so much fun planning them. Um, the kids have so much fun uh, interacting with them. As you can see from this photo, this is the pendulum painting uh, steam station that Stady created. And look at their faces, they were so happy with their design. Uh, so it's just a lot of fun. And then it also increases engagement with the library. You know, we, we can't have programming going on every hour that we are doing, we are in the library or that we are open. It's just not possible in terms of staffing and resources. No library could sustain that. And this gives those uh, kids that don't have the opportunity to come to programming, an opportunity to interact with STEAM um, activities. And then, it, of course, it introduces kids to careers. Uh, as I said, that's uh, the important aspect of it. Uh, that's why we put out our sign-in, that's why we display our books, you know. And then it promotes the growth mindset. Uh, as I said, with the typewriter example, yes, we set out challenges for them, 
but the goal isn't necessarily to have them complete the challenge. It's them interacting with STEAM, having those conversations, you know, um, and this promotes those STEAM conversations, you know, it gives us as staff and parents uh, the opportunity to talk to their kids, to introduce a variety of uh, new words to children, you know, um, and then, of course, it normalizes STEAM. Uh, the second STEAM station, as I said, was just those Dixie cups that are so cheap, and we just set them out, and it's an easy way to show the parents that, hey, you can have these STEAM conversations at home, and they're not difficult, because I think STEAM sounds like a really scary word, but with those paper cups, you can talk about weight distribution, because that's that's the important part of making sure the structure is tall and, and you can build it taller so that it's evenly distributed weight. Yeah, so that's, as I said, I love doing these team stations. They're so much fun. Um, but now I'm gonna pass it on to Sadie with team volunteers. So uh, to give an overview of our team volunteer program to start off with, uh, we take teen, uh, volunteers ages 12 to 18, and we tend to have an average of 30 volunteers each year, so we receive a pretty high number of volunteers. Um, I'll discuss ways that we kind of sought to uh, sought ways to enhance um, this traditional structure. So some basic uh, workforce skills that we focus on in our volunteer program generally um, is one, dependability. We want to set the expectations of a workplace so the teens benefit from that experience. Uh, that can be as simple as the teens just calling in when they're not going to be able to come in that day and knowing their schedule, those kinds of responsibilities. It can also look like self-starter responsibilities. So we have a task list that the team volunteers are welcome to consult on their own. They can pick a task and then they can go um, complete that task without any staff direction involved for some of those self-starter responsibilities. So that's kind of um, the element of dependability as a volunteer. The second one that we focus on is teamwork. This is uh, incorporated in a lot of different ways um, in a variety of tasks in our volunteer program because they tend, because we have so many volunteers, they tend to work in pairs or in threes. Um, so they work in teams a lot. And especially in programming, we have our volunteers help out um, with setting up, taking down, interacting with customers during the program. So they get to work as a team with staff members as well through that programming element. Finally, communication is a big one that we focus on. Um, we try to support this throughout the volunteer experience. So we have all volunteers interview with us in the beginning, and they often express that they want to increase their interpersonal skills, their communication skills. So we focus on that um, in terms of having them interact with their peers, so their fellow volunteers, also customers, and of course staff. So they're expected to interact and communicate with a variety of people throughout their volunteer experience. Um, this can even just look like they lead a customer over to a staff member when the customer asks them about something. Um, so it's simple stuff like that that we try to focus on building those communication skills as they volunteer. We also have them work on some social media projects um, that they contribute and something like book reviews and that sort of thing. So that's another element of communication we incorporate. So the next level of kind of our general volunteer program is our teen advisory board, um, which some of you may also have something like this. Um, we invite past volunteers to uh, apply when they've shown outstanding leadership skills. And uh, it's just a good way for them to get more involved in the library. And 
they are responsible generally for a monthly program as well as attending a regular meeting. So what has our teen advisory board um, kind of gone into? What, what skills have they taken on um, in addition to just the volunteer program in general is planning programs. So we've had our teen advisory board members work closely with staff to start planning and leading their own programs for their peers. And so they really take on the ownership of those programs and they do have to follow the same steps as staff. So they use our internal program plan as a tool to outline the program and then they um, take on leading it too when their skills um, are there to lead the program themselves. I have a few examples of this on our slide here. So the first one on the upper left hand corner is a teen tech hour. It was more of a drop in event. Our teen advisory board members led their peers through different technology and exploring that technology. On the upper right hand corner, you'll see a robotics program for teens. This was entirely planned and led by a teen advisory board member who had a lot of robotics experience. Um, and of course, they work closely again with staff to develop that program and showcase their own skills in that way. And then a similar uh, situation for the, the picture in the middle is a digital art program. Again, our teen advisory board member had a lot of skills in digital art and was able to share that with their peers through this program. Um, so the teen advisory board members gain an even another level of, of work experience um, going through this program planning similarly to staff. An additional program that um, came from our teen advisory board is this creative community project. Um, it was a way for the Teen Advisory Board to inspire their peers to engage with the community more. Um, and it was branded as Otter by the Teen Advisory Board. So this is, stands for Outstanding Teens Taking Extra Responsibility. So they had a lot of investment and ownership over this program. They chose the projects that we focused on and they were able to bring in a lot of their peers to help with this program and contribute to the community project. We also offered as the library volunteer hours for this program. So attendees got that aspect of it as well, which is helpful because a lot of teens are looking for those opportunities anyway, as their organizations often require them to get volunteer experience. So a couple examples of these successful programs um, that are featured on the slide is a holiday card program. We made holiday cards for residents in assisted living facilities. And then secondly, you'll see a lot of teens out who came to um, don't help create pet toys for the local animal shelter, which is in that second photo below. Um, so this was successful for a lot of reasons. The Teen Advisory Board got to even gain those further work experiences of inspiring their peers to contribute to a community project. And then the attendees um, obviously were looking for the outlet as well. So just a few lessons learned on teen volunteers. Um, if you have teen volunteers, you're probably familiar with some of these, these things already. Uh, the availability of teens is definitely something to contend with. Even during the summer, we have the experience that a lot of our teens um, are busy. They have the extracurricular activities that continue onward, um, even aside from school. And when they're not busy, they tend to take vacations with their families. So there is some scheduling um, difficulties with volunteers. However, over time, as the volunteer program evolves, you're going to build that um, group of dedicated teens who commit their time and are dependable. Um, so that's not as much of an issue over time. And then finally, we've really had to um, analyze what is the best number of volunteers that we can uh, effectively 
um, have at the library during the summer so that we can really optimize that opportunity for skill development. So we want them to get gain those work experiences and to um, provide the best opportunity for that. To um, conclude with the overall impact of our teen volunteer program, so of course, career readiness is a big part of that. Um, we try to incorporate workforce development as I've discussed into the volunteer program overall. They get to have those experiences where they build skills that will be helpful in the workplace. And the libraries, public libraries especially, are situated to really get to this idea of service learning which Oklahoma EDGE has as one of their work environment activities that can contribute to the ICAP, so that individual career action plan that teens have to um, you know, take on now. And so service learning is essentially taking those skills and knowledge and applying it to a real life situation in a community. And libraries are aptly situated to provide that opportunity to volunteers. So we want to continue developing our volunteer program towards this service learning idea and workforce development overall. Um, a couple of ways that we're going to do that is we're going to have our teen volunteers be more involved in discovery camp planning. Um, so that program series I discussed earlier, discovery camps, we want to have those teen volunteers really involved in the early stages of planning that those activities for the kids and being involved in that way. And then finally, we want to incorporate workshops. So that can include something like a resume workshop or professional communication, just stuff that we can incorporate into the volunteer program as they're there. And that way they can translate their experiences to something like um, a tool like a resume. Um, so that those are things we're looking to do in the future. And overall, we want to continue to enhance our program in relation to workforce development. Okay, so those were some of the ways that we are supporting Oklahoma Edge. We're really trying to incorporate STEAM um, more in the library and focusing on workforce development. I think because Oklahoma Edge is, Oklahoma Edge is so new that it's a little overwhelming, but uh, at South OKC, we're looking at it as an opportunity to introduce children to a variety of careers before they get to college and they're having to decide on a major and decide on what they're going to be doing in the future um, and having to make those decisions without any exposure to what that means and if they would even like that career or that major. Um, so it's just a really good opportunity to help them make their decisions based off of their interests, not necessarily just because they have to pick something. Um, so we would love to hear how you guys are supporting Oklahoma Edge, what you think of our, what we're doing, um, if you want to incorporate any of that stuff. So we've got our email address here, so please feel free to contact us. All right, thank you so much, Macy and Sadie, for um, this is something that I haven't really heard of before. So as a school librarian, this is um, excellent. So my one question is, for someone like me who this is the first time you're hearing about it, um, and you want to start somewhere, out of the different ones that you have gone over today, which one would you suggest, whether it's the PBS or the camps or the um, stations, what's the easiest one to kind of maybe get your feet wet to start with? Um, Sadie, you might uh, disagree, but I think it's the steam stations just because they're so, they're as difficult and as you want them to be, and they're really an easy introduction to different careers. Yeah, I agree with Maisie as well. I think steam stations are the easiest way to kind of um, get your feet into it. <laughs> um, these are just some of these uh, resources that we looked at for uh, for our programs, so feel free to look, look at those. Uh, 
And thank you for joining us. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you so much again for presenting um, for us. And thank you for those of you who joined us in this session. If you enjoyed this session, I would encourage you to um, consider joining the Children and Teen Services Roundtable. It's just a professional network um, of those of us in OLA who work with children and teens, and this is what we do. We share ideas about what we're doing, what's going on in our libraries, how we can engage um, with our kids, whether it's in a, a public library or a school library. Don't forget to complete your session evaluation in the conference app. We'll hope you will join us for many more conference sessions. Thank you so much.